Okay, let's start. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a uh, part of a series of lectures organized by CMSA in Harvard and also with Tsinghua University on literature and history of mathematical science. And this is the fourth lecture in this later part of the semester. And um, we, we are great to have all the great lecturers. And I will uh, ask uh, Mike Hopkins to chair this uh, session. So Mike. Thank you, Yao. Um, <clears throat> it's a great honor to introduce Yuri Manin, I think to give a proper introduction uh, of such an influential figure would take uh, a significant amount of time. Uh, he's well known for his deep contributions to, um, to algebraic geometry, number theory, topology, mathematical physics, and all the remarkable connections between them. He's also the author of many inspiring philosophical uh, essays. So without uh, further delay, um, here's Yuri Manin speaking about homotopy spectra and Diophantine equations. Thank you very much for inviting me and for attending my lecture and mic for presentation. Very flattering. So um, I have, I think, two large material to present to you so you can ask questions at any moment or uh, uh, more detailed exposition or, or shorter and so on and so on. Um, this is the, for those of you for whom only my slides will be accessible, uh, I start with a list of contents and I will briefly explain them later on. And uh, um, uh, now I will say a few words about the history of this subject. And um, uh, for a very long stretch in time in the history of mathematics, number theory and topology formed vast but disjoint domains of mathematical knowledge. Uh, I didn't even know how long ago uh, number theory uh, arose. Uh, but uh, Emmanuel Peyre reminds us in his short article that the Babylonian play tablet Plimpton 322, uh, so it was about 180, uh, 1800 years BC contained a list of integer solutions of the Diophantine equation a square plus b square equals to c square. It is of course an art, uh, archetypal theme of number theory, but it was named after Diophantus of Alexandria who lived far later, about 250 before BC. And, um, um, here, this, the picture of this Babylonian clay tab tablet. I was absolutely amazed when I learned that the professional linguists could decode it and to find out that it contains a large list of uh, solutions of this Diophantine equations. And um, so uh, that was, uh, I, I prefer to think about it as a, as a point of uh, uh, where, where the, the number theory was born, but topology was born much later. How it is very strange and it is not practically unknown that modern measure theory uh, one may say that it is a cousin of topology, measuring spaces, that uh, modern measure theory goes back to Archimedes. He is the author of the book Psammetus, who was approximately a contemporary of Diophantus. And what does Archimedes do 
in modern language. Well, imagine observable universe at least by that time. So what was observable sun, moon, and several planets that is moving stars, all other stars were unmoving. And uh, uh, Archimedes imagines that we have a, a great, great big uh, hug of, sun, of uh, sand, and we may try to be able to feel all this observable universe by sense. So question, how many small grains of sand is necessary to fill this volume? And uh, by that time, of course, uh, to the small world of scientists of that time, uh, there were many mathematical models and uh, he had to use all of them and also uh, estimates of relevant distances. Uh, but the point is that the estimated number of grades are quite large, 10 power 64. And Archimedes had to invent and describe a system of notation for large numbers, for far outside of the possibilities of any of the standard ancient systems. For example, uh, do you look I, I especially enumerated the pages here in my slides using Roman system. Now, how many of you can write mm, 2020, the number of this year, or 196, uh, 1,090? Uh, 926, for example, or something like that. Even such a small numbers from this viewpoint are this great trouble uh, expressible in Roman systems. Okay, uh, but anyway, the I want to argue that this construction of the first bridge between number theory and topology was accomplished only about 50 years ago, around 1970. It is the theory of spectra in stable homotopy theory. And this is the main subject of my talk, this bridge. But of course, mm, uh, in order to explain what I, want to say, I will have to um, explain uh, something about at what point of topology we start and to what point of number we will end or vice versa. And I will have, unfortunately, to appeal to the intuition of those listeners, mathematicians in the audience, who are somewhat accustomed to categorical reasoning. You remember, so category consists of objects and morphisms between them. And this is the, the main structure that you should have in, in, in mind. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so what I want to say now, that if you want to include uh, numbers, integers, into uh, more general mathematical context, you should imagine that each integer is kind of size cardinality, cardinality formally of finite set of, of, of given uh, uh, of cardinal. And uh, uh, finite sets, including empty set, forms a category F set, so finite sets, and already to interpret the inequality uh, that one number is no, no larger than another, one needs to look at morphisms. Uh, one needs to look at what is in this category monomorphisms. Uh, it's uh, 
slightly uh, more constructions are needed in order to multiplicate the integers. So categorical interpretation, you are considering pairs, uh, that is direct products of finite sets. Uh, associativity is a reflection of what is called monoidal structure, this category. And addition in an is already much more sophisticated construction. The point is that if two sets are disjoint, so they, they have no common elements, then of course the uh, sum of cardinalities is cardinality of union. But uh, there are many finite sets containing um, uh, common elements and they are not disjoint. So how should we do with that? And, and finally, we must pass from natural numbers to integers. And this requires one step higher. The point is that categories themselves form a category when they are objects and morphisms between them are functors. And we need constructions in the category of categories. Um, so um, this was approximately what intuition you should have in mind when we are speaking about uh, uh, theory of sets or theory of categories and integers. And, and the next uh, uh, point uh, in topology, you should imagine how we could reconstruct integers from uh, in, into a topological intuition from the intuition of spaces where there is a notion of close points uh, and uh, covers and things like that. But to imagine a natural number n not as a number of uh, n grades of sand, but the dimension of a manifold, for example, the sphere as n. Uh, it um, requires much more strains of intuition because then when, how do we know that two manifolds have one and the same dimension, for example. Uh, categorically, this means that there should be some kind of relationship between them that allows us to deform one to another. And this will be the definition of equality of numbers. And this is involves in factorial definitions of various classes of morphisms that we will declare invertible ones and so on. But as soon as we accomplish this, then one can lift to topology addition and multiplication then after some more work passage from n to z as well. So um, now the first, the simplest imagination of bridge between finite sets and topological spaces and a bridge that can be drawn in both directions is this. Uh, this is a machinery of the so-called simplicial sets. And uh, the simplest, the most intuitive constructions refer to uh, simplicial sets associated to covering, coverings of uh, topological spaces. Uh, roughly speaking, we will see later what is simplex, geometric simplex. Uh, it is, uh, uh, here is n dimensional geometric simplex. We consider n dimensional real space, n plus one dimensional real space with coordinate and consider product of uh, coordinate uh, intervals from zero to one along all axes, so n plus one axis, and consider point there. And now consider only those points 
where sum of coordinates equals to one. Then we get uh, generalization of triangle to any dimension and it is called simplex. So I will return back and um, And uh, uh, I will recall here uh, on the combinatorial set up, which embodies the minimal category of based finite sets, based meaning finite set together with marked point, base point, uh, whose objects are just totally ordered sets. Well, one can denote them this way, 0, 1, n, and so on. No, 0 is a base point. And morphisms are non-decreasing maps from n to n, so, uh, sending 0 to 0. And uh, the set of all morphisms then is generated uh, by two classes. There are many morphisms, of course, but it is generated by two classes of maps. Uh, one phase number i and another class uh, degeneration number i. Phase number one at a embedding of this to this, which omits value i. And this one is non-decreasing surjection, which takes the value i twice. And uh, although there are many, many relations between them, but uh, if you check for in a concrete situation, only this list of relations, quadratic ones, so to speak, then uh, all of them are uh, generated by them. Okay. And then a simplicial set X can be defined as a functor from the category of uh, finite sets to the sum category of sets. And one simplicial set is a structure consisting of family of sets X, N and family of maps corresponding to each non-decreasing map from here to here, uh, sending identity to identity and product to product in reverse order. So um, uh, if we will be considering only uh, ice uh, boundary maps and ice degeneration map and the respective relations, we got quite convenient and widely used description of simplicial sets. And uh, so uh, this is bridge. And how do we pass through this bridge from combinatorics to geometry? We start with geometric simplices. I already gave its definition. But then, uh, uh, starting with simplicial set, we construct its geometric realization, its product of uh, product meaning just simply meaning that we made for each n, we construct as many simplices, independent simplices as we have simplices as we have point in the set X and uh, then produce the uh, simple biggest equivalence relation which, which is needed for this. And uh, the most, uh, the simplest, but very important example is this. If we have the boundary of uh, the simplex of dimension n plus one, it is, uh, geometric realization of the uh, uh, of the sphere of dimension n minus one. So sphere is so to speak round, and the simplex is so to speak triangle. There are many angles, but uh, topologically, anatomically, it is the same. And uh, uh, so we, I have shown briefly how to. Uh, pass this bridge in one direction. Now, how to pass it in opposite direction? You start with a topological space Y and do it with a covering by open or by closed sets U 
alpha. Uh, alpha uh, belongs to a set of indices. And for each n, uh, we denote by xn systems of those indices here, alpha, uh, which produce the system of sets with non-empty intersection. And uh, then uh, uh, obvious condition on maps. And the role of homotopy appearing at this point finds a very beautiful expression in the following fact. It is simply stated, but not quite simply proved. Namely, that if we start with a simplicial set and produce a homotopical realization, x, and it will be geometric, homotopically equivalent to the initial y, if u is a locally finite covering and all non-empty finite intersections are contractible. Uh, and this construction forms the background for the much more sophisticated machinery of homotopical spectra. And now I will uh, pass to them. Uh, so plan of exposition, uh, we just give a first formal, sufficiently formal presentation of homotopy spectra, then, um, and we want to try, like to draw attention of a listener to the category of gamma spaces. It was invented also comparatively recently, and it has several different applications to construction and study of new geometries. Uh, for example, geometries in characteristic one, or more generally, and the spectrum of Z. Uh, those who studied algebraic geometry uh, will be amazed by this brief descriptions. Section two introduces finally our main uh, number theoretic object, a distribution of rational or algebraic points on algebraic varieties uh, based upon counting of points of bounded sizes. So for example, uh, if uh, we take uh, the list of solutions of a square plus b square equals to c square from the Babylonian uh, clay tablet. Uh, it is of course, it is a finite list and how they chose it. Well, uh, let's call, let's consider a, b, c triple and call its height the maximum of A, B, C. Then of course, for each uh, uh, given boundary H, uh, there is only finite number of such A, B, Cs. And in principle, we can try to produce a table of them. It's remarkable that in ancient Babylon, there were people who wanted to do it. I find it absolutely fantastic. Okay, then uh, section three is pure categorical sexes, uh, section. It is the modern machinery of assemblers and this modern machinery of assembles, assemblers is exactly what I will be calling this uh, contemporary bridge between the two areas now. Then uh, arithmetic and geometric environments and then uh, possibilities to avoid point count on uh, algebraic varieties, but I'm not sure that I will be able to explain any details about it. Anyway, I gave pretty long list of uh, references and anybody who is really interested by this story can look at the original papers. Okay, now a brief presentation of homotopy spectra. Um, the notion of spectra in homotopy theory involved, evolved through several stages. As I said, uh, it was quite recent, no, no more than 50 years ago. And I will briefly describe two of them, uh, the simplest sequential spectra and uh, the, the most convenient gamma spaces. 
before starting, before passing to spectra, uh, let us consider, first of all, finite pointed sets and define the so-called smash product uh, of them. Um, if you forget about base points, star X and star Y, uh, then you can just form the product X cross Y. And then imagine that this is something like plane with X coordinate in this direction and Y coordinate in this direction. Then there are two coordinate axes, uh, generally X cross point of base point of Y and the and uh, base point of X cross Y. So they form parts, subsets of X cross Y. Now we take their union and smash them into one point. It's not easily, easy, quite easy to imagine it even for the usual plane, but anyway, uh, so theoretically it's an easy construction. And uh, the result of this smashing will be base point of smash product. And then um, uh, the uh, simplest version of spectra, sequential spectra introduced in 53. So the sequential spectrum is a sequence of based simplicial sets. You will remember hopefully what are simplicial sets. And then between them, there should be structure maps, which are sigma n. We take set number n, take smash product with uh, one dimensional triangle, so boundary of two dimensional uh, triangle, and um, take smash product and map to here. And um, the sequence of such uh, ENs and sigma ENs is the sequential spectrum. And this, the sphere sequential spectrum is the, consists of the sets and identical SNs. And this is a kind of um, uh, analog of integer, analog of natural numbers in the first presentation of homotopy spectra. And um, now, again, uh, we, we, we still cannot really pass even to integers. We introduce, must introduce stable equivalence since we, we must uh, reach commutativity and so on and so on. Uh, now, for me, the most important uh, object will be gamma spaces introduced by Graham Siegel in, in 1974. Uh, here, uh, as in a, an exposition on paper by Lidakis, uh, we denote by gamma the category of based finite sets. Formerly, I denoted it n in square brackets. But uh, now the morphisms in it will be just uh, arbitrary maps preserving base points that are sending H0 to zero, but not necessarily non-decreasing ones. And uh, gamma space uh, E is a functor from this category gamma to based simplicial sets sending uh, zero plus here to point in simplicial sets to base point. And gamma spaces themselves are objects of the category which is denoted in this way in the paper by Lidakis. And morphisms are their natural uh, functors. And uh, now following Lidakis, we will just call uh, based simplicial set simply spaces and space is called discrete if it's simplicial set is constant. And um, uh, the central theorem in this 
constructions is this. So one can construct a functor of two variables here, 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 and here in the same category and smash with, with respect to the smash product. The first two arguments can be replaced by the uh, so homomorphism from here to here may be replaced by homomorphism from the first argument to homomorphisms over the uh, second and the third. And this is very typical in uh, uh, categorical algebra. We, we see it already on the level of linear spaces. Uh, typical uh, relation. And uh, therefore, uh, category of gamma spaces endowed with smash product is a symmetric monoidal category, which is a vast generalization of, uh, uh, of multiplication of numbers, integers. Uh, I have here a sketch of proof, but I will omit it. And now we want to find a very important object in the theory of spectra, the sphere spectrum S, and it is the unit object in the symmetric monoidal category. And uh, uh, this construction suggests to consider homotopical enrichments of arithmetics, which pass through from ring of integers to the sphere spectrum S. Uh, now, um, uh, all this philosophy crystallized not so long ago, but still 50 years, it's pretty long time, but uh, it was, it, it clearly, uh, puts a challenge, find, discover new information of number theory using the machinery of homotopy theory de uh, developed independently. And this is the main, the focus of my talk here. And mm, it is, uh, uh, the, the, the relevant new article uh, is not yet completely written. Uh, and uh, uh, I will focus upon the ongoing research joined with Matilde Marcolli, which is dedicated to the application of spectra to the problems of distribution of rational and algebraic points on algebraic varieties. Okay, so now I pass to the number theoretic uh, domain surrounding this one, one end of this bridge. Uh, it will be called Diophantine equations, distribution of rational points on algebraic varieties. Uh, first of all, uh, as I already said, we will be studying here how fast the number of solutions of a system of equations, polynomial equations, say with integral coefficients or coefficients which are algebraic numbers, if one first restricts the counting the number of solutions to height not larger than h. And then let's h grow and let's imagine what can happen with this number of solutions. In order to define heights over general algebraic number fields, we need the following preparations. So we know that Edina, those of you who did not really study uh, uh, number fields, uh, you can uh, always imagine that our variable number, number field K is just 
the field Q of rational numbers, and just to keep in mind only example of rational numbers. And um, it has the set of places V uh, represented as a union in this way, finite and infinite ones. And um, in the case when it is rational numbers, uh, this set consists of just one element, and this set, uh, sorry, uh, this set consists of just one element, and this set consists of all prime numbers, two, three, five, and so on. Uh, and uh, if we choose an element here, uh, we mm, uh, denote we can form the respective completion of K and we denote by KV the respective completion. And again, if we are working with rational numbers, then this completion are real numbers and these completions are uh, periodic numbers for all P. Okay, so um, if V is finite, then uh, we can define uh, by O V the ring of integers and it has a maximal I ideal M V. And so periodically, uh, this will be periodic integers and here it will be periodic integers divisible by P. And um, they form an additive group in particular and with a measure and the, the measure invariant with respect to uh, a shift uh, is normalized in such a way that measure of integers becomes one. For Archimedean V, so for real numbers, it will be the usual uh, Lebesgue measure if it is real and if V is complex, then it is induced by Lebesgue measure on complex plane for which the unit square 0, 1 plus 0, 1 multiplied by i has volume 2, not 1 but 2. But this is of course not very essential, just correct normalization. And um, then we can define the map a local norm from kv to non-negative real numbers uh, defined by the condition uh, that differential uh, of uh, x multiplied by lambda is exactly this local norm multiplied by differential of x and this gives the product formula this product equals to one a very useful exercise for you who did not work with this is to see what all this means for rational numbers Q. And um, uh, now this essentially means some kind of triviality, but uh, but formulated in, in, in quite precise way, in, namely if you take the rational number A divided by B, where A and B are integers which are co-prime, then you can represent this number A by B as, as a product of P prime numbers uh, dividing numerator in correct degrees and divided by product by prime numbers divi dividing by denominators in correct degrees. So this meaning of this formula. And finally, consider a projective space with a chosen system of homogeneous coordinates denoted like this. And uh, we can define then the exponential height of a point here uh, by this formula. It's a very important formula. Technically, it's the central definition of this part of my talk. And uh, because of the product formula, if you replace homogeneous coordinates 
x0, xn by equivalent homogeneous coordinates lambda x0, lambda xn, then uh, the definition of exponential veil height does not change. Okay, and now we can pass already to non-trivial um, calculus uh, and define height zeta functions. Consider a pair consisting of a projective variety, so algebraic variety embedded in the projective space, or if you wish, a system of polynomial homogeneous equations uh, with coefficients in some field of algebraic numbers. And uh, uh, then an ample line bundle on it. This is officially the system of coordinates. Uh, homogeneous coordinates, and then we can define the height function uh, on uh, k rational points as above, uh, and uh, then define the height zeta functions. So we take the sum over all rational solutions, but the larger is solution, the higher is the power if, if we imagine S as a real number, then S positive real number, then the larger solution is uh, the small, smaller build becomes its uh, contribution to zeta function. And uh, if you imagine, and it is very important, if you imagine S as a complex number, then the same refers to uh, real parts of this. And uh, uh, suppose that you have a locally closed some variety U, so you add to old system equations some new age or equations and more maybe inequalities also defined over K. And then we can define uh, the general measure of number of solutions not restricting to uh, to given heights. Uh, the lower limit of positive reals for which zeta function absolutely converges if uh, the real part of S lies in the right half plane starting with sigma. So, this is real number, real non-negative number, and uh, I will call it a conver convergence boundary. So this convergence boundary is defined for any system of homogeneous equations of, of some variables. Uh, it is finite because already for projective spaces it's finite, it's also a good, exercise for you uh, try to prove it over ra uh, uh, rational numbers for any projective space. And uh, if this is infinite, then it is non-negative. And intuitively, we will be imagining that if V sits inside U, then it con contains considerably less set of k points if uh, sigma for u larger than sigma for e. So it's the, the general measure, not looking at, at the many details, but very uh, convenient. And also we may say that V and U contain approximately the same amount of K points if these two uh, convergence boundaries coincide. And uh, for example, uh, this was the notion uh, introduced in the papers of battery and money in our papers of 90 or uh, one year earlier in my paper with Frank and Chinkel. Um, 
accumulating some variety. So you are imagining points in this variety, but they are somehow accumulating uh, into some closed sub-variety, near and on the some closed sub-variety. So consider the risky closed sub-variety V in U. So just simply uh, take the, the, the whole system equations and add uh, some more equations. And then calculate the number of points in this V of height non larger than H and divide it, divide it by the number of such points in the uh, uh, difference U minus V. If it tends to zero when H tends to infinity, then we call it accumulating some variety. This is the case when the, these two sigmas will coincide. And um, oh, sorry, the, uh, uh, V and U minus V. And uh, sorry, U and U minus V. And now I will describe a categoric, categorical environment appropriate for describing various versions of accumulation and connecting distributions with spectra. So as I said, I have described separately the topological side of uh, the Marx and then separately Diophantine side. And now, bridge, the modern contemporary bridge. Uh, uh, I will use constructions invented by Inna Zakharevich in the 1917. And in our paper with Marconi in 18, we gave them a brief exposition and tried to stress their universality. So um, consider a, a category. We ask nothing about it temporarily. The only thing that we want that it should have a unique initial object, empty set, so to speak. And uh, then two morphisms, U1 to U and U2 to U are called disjoint if there exists the fiber products of U1 and 2 and equals empty and is empty. Uh, if it is so, then this product also exists see, and they are canonically isomorphic. But in the case of disjoint power pair, we want this isomorphism to be unique because between uh, two empty sets there exists a unique isomorphism. And uh, a sieve in this category is then some full subcategory C prime. I recall you that uh, subcategory consists of some objects of C and it's called full if between any objects of C prime, the set of morphisms is just the same as in C. So a C if is a full subcategory such that if you have a morphism on C and if U belongs to C prime, then V also belongs to C prime. That is C uh, morphisms uh, in uh, morphisms in C, uh, sorry, morphisms in, in C prime um, are such that if we start with something, if we finish by something of C prime, then look at what we started, then we started also from C prime. And um, if you fix an object U in C, we can apply this notion to category of morphisms, not just category, category of morphisms. Sometimes they say it's over category C over U, something like the coverings or, uh, or fiber spaces or something like that. And factor over, over categories, functors induced by lifting morphism like that induce 
factors between sieves in the respective ore categories. Okay, uh, so this notion is convenient to define what is called the Grotendieck topology on C. It is a collection of sieves, one for each object U of C, satisfying three axioms. Intuitively, um, uh, it is uh, for each object U of C, we should be given its coverings. In the classical case, just say covering by open subspaces, but Grotendieck introduced very important uh, generalization of it, uh, various sets of maps into this object may be also uh, imagined as their coverings. And this is formally uh, axioms to which uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, coverings must satisfy. And um, Mm, as, as I said, for any object of a category with Grotendieck topology, such a category is also called Grotendieck site, we can define the notion of covering family, collection of morphisms such that the full subcategory containing all morphisms in C factoring through FI belongs to this collection of Cs. So, union of coverings of elements of coverings, roughly speaking, is a covering. And now the main definition of Igna Zakharevich, assembler. An assembler is a small category C with a Grotendieck topology and with initial object denoted by the same letter as empty set. All morphisms there must be monomorphisms. I use this word when I reminded you how to define uh, the inequality. M is no more, not larger than N, if imagine, one imagines M and then as cardinality of finite sets, monomorphisms. And empty family is a covering of the final initial object, sorry, initial object. And two morphisms are called disjoint, this, this product is empty. And uh, we also require that if you have two pairwise disjoint finite covering families of U, uh, then they should admit the common refinement, which is also a disjoint uh, finite covering family. So uh, assemblers themselves form a category. And I told you that in fact, in order to go to homotopical algebra and so on, uh, we must uh, imagine the uh, rebuild tower of, uh, of uh, uh, Sorry, table towers of construction starting with categories, then category of categories, then category of categories of categories, and so on. Uh, and uh, what uh, I will do, and what is the main new uh, construction in our project, is uh, constructions and study of assemblers related to the distribution of rational points. And uh, for to this end, we must define formally sieves related to it. But before that, uh, we will, I will show that to assemblers are associated, naturally associated certain spectra. So on the one hand, we have uh, uh, sieves and assemblers associated to distribution of points. On the other hand, we have spectra. Consider the Grotendieck side C and denote 
by C0, full subcategory of non-initial objects. So just temporarily delete initial object from there. And uh, uh, then we can define a union of uh, family of assembles numbered by elements X of a set as a category whose initial objects are like that and to which one initial object then is formally added. And so mm, from assembler one can pass to gamma spaces and to spectra. Uh, we can construct the following category W of C if we have an ensemble C. Uh, one object is a family of objects of C numbered by a finite set I. Uh, and uh, there is no, no, no initial object among them, like that. And one morphisms uh, consists from a map of this indices, I to J, and the family of morphisms, uh, which is, uh, uh, corresponds to the map of finite sets, so renumbering, so to speak but not necessarily one-to-one -one numbering and uh, uh, such that each such set of morphisms is a disjoint covering form family. And there is a proposition that all morphisms here in WC are monomorphisms. Uh, uh, then, uh, if C is, so to speak, closed category that is, has all pullbacks, then WC also closed. And uh, given a family of assemblers indexed by, numbered by elements of a set, then we can form the full subcategory of product whose objects are families of objects for which all the finite number of them are indexed by empty set and consider the functor like that and then it induces the equivalence of categories. So essentially the functor W uh, uh, produces equivalence between the direct sums of number C and V and uh, applied to uh, this wedge sum of CX. Okay, uh, I will omit the argument that it's pretty technical, I don't have much time. And now how to move from here to gamma spaces, spectra and K theory. To move from this standpoint to gamma spaces, we start with the category whose objects are finite sets. Again, a different notation. It was already in brackets and it was square brackets and it was with plus and now it will be like that. And uh, now all morphisms are maps sending zero to zero. Uh, and uh, then we can construct for appointed sets in an assembler, we can construct this. And one step further, we can construct the so-called the periodic smash product. X multiplied by a nerve of this category, this, then this, and then this. Ina Zakharevich defines the symmetric sequential spectrum as a spectrum of simplicial sets in which the space number K is given by the diagonal of bisimplicial set like that. And it's here. Uh, there was a notation, which I probably didn't explain, N, nerve of a category. It is general notation nerve of a category. Uh, it is, you should imagine a kind of graph where all vertices are, correspond to objects of the category and uh, morphisms correspond to arrows in this oriented graph. Okay, and uh, 
uh, the first main result uh, in the first paper by Inna Zakarevich says that if C is an assembly, we can construct then uh, the uh, group that was constructed before that independently K0 of C, and it is canonically isomorphic to the abelian group generated by isomorphism class, classes of objects, modulo the family of relations which are indexed by finite disjoint covering families. Each such family produces the relation A equals uh, class of A equals to class, sum of the classes of AI. So intuitively, it's very clear if your object somehow uh, can be cut into pairwise disjoint uh, objects, then its object you should imagine uh, as a sum, formal sum of this uh, pairwise disjoint sub objects of it. So we are forgetting about how exactly they are put together. Uh, again, I will omit the proof here. And now, we will move to our main preoccupation, construction of assemblies related to the distribution of rational points on algebraic varieties. So we know that uh, we suggest to uh, imagine assemblies via sieves. And so we start with uh, rational points, but in the categorical environment, and uh, explain what sieves are important for us. So consider a projective variety over K uh, denoted by U. So it is, um, again, you should imagine a system of homogeneous equations, finite system of homogeneous uh, polynomial equations over Q. And uh, uh, LU ample rank one vector bundle, like again, sufficiently to imagine just that uh, you fix the, um, uh, the coordinates in this polynomial equation. So don't allow to, to make linear transformations or quadratic transformation, even if they are one to one, just fix them. And by definition, objects of the category CULU are locally closed subvarieties, also defined over K, K. And morphisms are just the structure embeddings V in U. L is not mentioned explicitly here, but it's natural. Uh, LV. We say that it is induced by LU, by restriction. This means again that locally, that essentially we are passing from a system of homogeneous equation to a larger system. We add some more equations and the variety becomes smaller. Structure embeddings are compatible with this additional data. So we have actually structure functions that make uh, each this, a full subcategory of this under precomposition. And that means that it is a C, C. And uh, I will call such categories geometrical sieves because I did not yet consider distribution of rational points. And now we introduce the arithmetical seeds, sieves. Um, the Family of those morphisms I as above, together with their sources and targets, for which uh, the, uh, the convergence boundary for smaller variety uh, is smaller than convergence boundary for larger variety, they form a sieve. 
And it is our first arithmetical sieves for u and u. And it's pretty easy to see that we, if we have a two-step ladder of locally closed embeddings with this property and this and this, then of course this is this and this. So the composition of these embeddings is also a morphism in this arithmetical sieve. And uh, please pay attention to the fact that if there is only a finite number of points in V, then sigma equals to zero, but it's not true. Uh, uh, converse statement is not true. For any elliptic curve or for any even abelian variety over K and for any, many other classes of V, sigma equals to zero. And we really do not have a, a complete geometric description of it. And um, using sieves like that, we can easily introduce the respective arithmetic assemblies. The relevant Grothendieck topology is simply the, the risky topology and um, empty set is just the empty scheme. Uh, also later, I, unfortunately, I will not have time to explain it. Uh, what was remarkable uh, is what uh, was understood only quite recently. I took it in the paper which appeared in archive in 2020, uh, that uh, if there are no points in V of key, this is just empty set. If it is empty set, nevertheless, there exists an extremely interesting and non-trivial assemblers uh, uh, made out of this empty set. Uh, I have included in this uh, slides, uh, this as an appendix after the list of references, but I certainly will have no time to explain it here. So in the remaining two sections, I will sketch two diverging paths uh, leading from distribution of k rational points u of k and u to various further versions of the arithmetical sieve. Not one, so I, I can suggest you not one, but several versions of arithmetic sieves and they are in a sense diverging. So in the next section four, I will look at the more narrow class of varieties, only Fano varieties, for which more precise data about behavior, some heights are known or conjectured. And in the last section, restricted to the case of rational number, so I will consider uh, rational points as sub subsets of adelic points and try to go beyond heights by using new tools for studying the distribution of adelic points themselves. Okay. So, one of varieties and tie canonical heights and points count. So let's consider with arithmetical examples, simple arithmetical examples, that is uh, just one dimensional varieties. So consider, well, this is the, the general notation. Uh, this is the number of, first of all, yeah, uh, this is general definition so will be, this is the number of points whose height is uh, bounded by B on U, the system of coordinates LU. And uh, earlier, I based the definition of the of an arithmetical sieve upon an intuitive idea that uh, this morphism belongs to a sieve if the number of k points in U is considerably uh, uh, considerably. Sorry, in V is considerably less than this number on U. V less than U. And used uh, convergence boundaries for it. 
And now I will uh, much more precise count of points in order to define subtle sieves, but in a more narrow class of varieties U using counting functions themselves in place of convergence boundaries. And to have some intuition about it, start with one dimensional U that is just curves. Uh, if it is a smooth, irreducible curve of genus G with non-empty set of rational points, then there are three basic alternatives. Genus of uh, curve equals to zero. Then it is just projective line and uh, LU is proportional or just equals to entire canonical class. And then the number of points of height bounded by B is approximately proportional to B. If G is one, so it is an elliptic curve. It has some, some rank of Picard group R. Then uh, this number grows like logarithm of B power R minus one. And if genus is larger than zero, then this become constant if B be enough. This is the famous, uh, uh, this was long famous conjecture and it was proved by Faltus. And uh, we expect some typical behaviors of multidimensional analogs in the introduction. They are collected in the introduction to our pupil paper. But below, I will stop considering all varieties, but we'll focus upon fun of varieties. They will be multidimensional generalization of genus zero curves. It's a variety with ample anti canonical bundle. Okay. So the most precise conjectural asymptotic formula, but it is conjectural, I must stress right away, for fun of varieties or their the risky open subsets this dense set of points has the following form. This number is proportional to B multiplied by a certain power of logarithm B. And this power might be a rank of Picard group minus one. And it is certainly wrong for many subclasses of final varieties. But on the other hand, it is stable under the direct products. It is compatible with predictions of Hardy Littlewood method for complete intersection. Let me remind you that Hardy Littlewood invented one of the strongest technique uh, in the 20th century for counting a uh, number of solutions of large system of system of uh, uh, homogeneous equation where the number of variables is very large in comparison with their degrees. And finally, it is true for quotients of semi, semi-simple algebraic groups, modular parabolic subgroups. And uh, below, I will reproduce some of the argument of that paper proving this statement, because uh, critically, it is a critically important um, to have in mind one concrete case that it is true uh, in a uh, more extended environment, this statement, the definitions will change, but the statement will remain. So for example, consider direct products. Uh, consider two data, pair of data is above. You must study the behavior of this number and LU cross V is just lift from LU uh, from U and LV from V and then 
it stands our product on the product you open. So in this context, we can cons may consider ourselves by consideration of logarithmic heights satisfying the exact equality like that. And this will be applied to the case of anti-canonical heights. And uh, uh, now we consider more general situation, just consider two infinite families of non-decreasing real numbers, lambda i and mu j, and allow each number to be repeated several times so that they will have finite multiplicities. Then form an, a new family, just product lambda i mu j, again ordered non-decreasingly, and denote uh, the, and lambda b the number of i's with this inequality and similarly for these two. And uh, uh, stability under the direct product, which I want to prove is a consequence of the following essentially elementary number theoretical lemma. Uh, if we have such asymptotics for lambda and similar asymptotics for mu, but this constant may be different and uh, this constant may be different. Uh, then uh, for product, we have uh, asymptotics, which is essentially product of these two constants and B again the same, and then logarithm R plus S plus one uh, and one more additional constant, uh, which is an Euler beta function, universal beta function. And the sketch of proof is that we have uh, such inductive formulas like that. And error term has the same structure as the main one, but R is less by R minus one. We can apply this formula inductively and get at the end the main expression for the, uh, for, for the main term. And uh, so we can rewrite it like that and then we get the expected result. Uh, how about hardy little wood method and complete intersections? Below I will sketch for following the paper by Iguza, methodology and results of applications of hardy little wood for the, in the setup of final complete intersections in projective spaces. Uh, they are can serve as an example of study of distribution of rational points in adelic spaces. And there are some recent developments to which I soon pass below. And as I said, in the appendix, uh, we have a far reaching generalization of the story in the context of assemblers. So if we have a projective space with a fixed system of homogeneous coordinates like that, and the base field, you can imagine it to be Q and consider forms like that and of degree uh, di and denote by V projective variety, uh, which is a non-singular complete intersection of such hyperpore, hypersurfaces. Then it's anti-canonical line bundle is this. And therefore it is a Fana variety if uh, the sum of, uh, if the dimension plus one of projective space is larger than the sum of degrees. And uh, how summation of our points may be approximately approximated by integration over a data at the spaces is briefly explained in this Z paper and then in section five and section six. Uh, I will omit the explanations about the generalized flat manifolds and uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps I should temporarily at least stop here and it's already 20 past three and uh, probably I will ask is, if there are 
any questions or uh, quests for more detailed explanations. Um, if there are any, I was just, if there's any questions, uh, I think the best thing is to post them in the Q&A um, and I can read them out loud to, to Professor Manning. Sorry, was it a question? Uh, there are no questions at the moment. Um, questions at the moment, so it probably was too difficult. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Oh, here's one. Um, Arnav Tripathi writes, uh, what can be proven about distributions of rational points using the assembler slash spectra technology? Uh, what will be what? The... What can be proven, of, what can you prove about distribution of rational points uh, using assemblers? Um, it's not so easy what uh, essentially the type of results you get without going much further to uh, homotopical topology is just that rational points normally are distributed uh, in some sub varieties in such locally closed sub varieties in such a way that some of them contain much more points than uh, everything other. But then when you cut them off, then you get someone the next step of this ladder and so on. And then, and then after all, you will consider you will get an open sub variety and it contains in a sense most of the points but not in the sense of counting by heart so this is the main intuition that uh, is checked and proved in many many cases and uh, uh, i think before uh, our uh, paper in preparation it, it never was stated in such a precise way there were many examples and intuitively clear pictures, but now we can see it very, very precisely. Uh, but uh, if one goes uh, goes further uh, on the road of using uh, this intuition and theory of assemblers, then one passes to quite non-trivial higher key theories of objects related to distribution of rational points. But for this, I already have no time. OK, thank you. Um, there was one further question that appeared uh, that, that says, uh, that asks uh, if the, I'll just read the question. So do I get it right that we make a projective variety into a Groton deep topos and then make it into a spectrum. Spectrum. Yeah, in a sense, yes. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. So those are those are the questions that have appeared so far, um, and uh, I think it's been a very clear talk so far, <laughs> and I'm excited to hear more. So. Uh, Thank maybe, you. <laughs> maybe you should just continue. I think you have one section left. Is that right? Or oh, here's Yao. Yao, do you? Oh, well, I just wanted to say thank you. But uh, do you do you want to talk more, or you just want to stop here? Well, I think that uh, the remaining part is pretty large, and if I start it, I will never be able to stop it. <laughs> okay. Well. Thank you very much indeed, it's very nice. You are welcome. And thank you very much for inviting me and for flattering words. Yeah, good. Okay, I'm looking forward to see you right up. Yeah, and so are the slides available somewhere? Will they be available? Uh, slides must be available, yes. Uh, uh, Ryan has slides. Um, uh, without appendix, and uh, Axel Rohn has slides with appendix. The slides are available on our website. If
I don't know if you go to the um, web page for this event. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's terrific. I feel. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So, Mike, give me a call now. Okay. Sorry. Okay, bye bye.